Hello everybody and welcome to this food poverty webinar on the importance of the right to food. Um, we have with us today three panellists um, from several different organisations. So um, Sustain, which is the Alliance for Better Food and Farming in the UK. Um, we have a representative um, expert in international law from the University of Edinburgh. Um, and we have um, a representative from Nourish Scotland who are responsible for the Glasgow Declaration on Food and Climate. Um, we are going to begin with a series of presentations and I'll introduce everybody individually before they speak. Um, and at the end of the presentations, then we'll have an opportunity for a panel discussion and for questions and answers. So if everybody could please put any questions that they have for the panelists around the subject of right to food or the work that they bring up during their presentations, then please could you put those in the question and answer function or in the chat box and we'll get round to those um, in at the end of the presentations. Very quickly, I'm just going to introduce Godan and what we do for those that aren't very familiar yet with our work. Global Open Data for Agriculture and Nutrition supports the proactive sharing of open data to deal with urgent challenges such as in, um, ensuring global food security. At the heart of Godan is a network of over 1,200 partners from government, private and public sector organisations. And we focus on building high level support among governments, policymakers, international organisations and the private sector. We look at promoting collaborations in order to harness the growing amounts of data generated by new technologies in order to solve long standing nutrition and food security challenges. Um, if you'd like to find out more about what we do, you can have a look at our website www.godan.info forward slash about Godan um, or you are very welcome to contact myself, Catherine Bailey or our chief scientist Sushith Anand who is also responsible for our working, um, working group programmes. Um, so without any ado, I would like to introduce you to um, our first speaker, Imogen Richmond, Richmond Bishop, excuse me, who is programme coordinator on the right to food at the UK Food and Farming um, Alliance Sustain. Imogen's worked on a number of global human rights projects, including looking at unaccompanied migrant children across um, Europe, supporting them, um, looking at land rights in South America, and looking into socioeconomic rights across England. Um, Imogen, if you're ready, then I would really like to pass over to you. Thanks, Kate. Sorry, my name trips everyone up. It's far too long. Um, so like you said, uh, Sustain the Alliance for Better Food and Farming is an alliance organisation, as the name suggests, and we're made up of around 100 member and observer organisations that work on our food system, either a local, national or an international level. Uh, the team at Sustain, so we, together we coordinate a number of different networks and projects that work at pretty much all aspects of the food system, from food growing to health and nutrition to food insecurity. Um, as Kate said, so I coordinate the Right to Food programme and I've been doing that for nearly four years now since its inception in 2017. And this pro project sort of grew out of a, a growing awareness for the need of enhanced legal protections, as well as taking a joined up systemic approach to tackling food insecurity in the UK. Some of the wins that we've had um, over the past few years include um, UK wide hassle food and security measurement, as well as the inclusion of the Right to Food in political party manifestos in 2019. The right to food has also been taken up by an, as a campaigning tool by a number of different grassroots groups, which is great to see, including the Fan Supporting Food Banks group who've been working with local authorities across England to create right to food areas and cities. Um, they also have a petition running that closes today. So if you're based in the UK and you'd like to sign that, I'll put it in the chat after I speak. Um, that's currently calling for the UK government to incorporate the right to food into domestic legislation. So first of all, I think it's probably quite important to say, you know, what is the right to food? 
Uh, so first of all, it's a right that successive UK governments have pledged to uphold on an international stage, but have yet to bring this right home, so to speak. And th this right is not yet currently incorporated into domestic legislation, which means that it's not a judiciable right. And I'll be talking more about that later. Uh, secondly, the right to food is not about providing food aid or just supporting charitable initiatives that are providing food, but rather it's about having protections and measures in place to ensure that all people can access food at all times in a dignified, sustainable and culturally appropriate way. Um, so for most people, the right to food would really be about um, ensuring that the work welfare and immigration systems will work together to ensure that people can afford to buy food that's sufficient to their needs. However, for other people, the state might have to step in in some ways, either part time or all of the time. And this will include an institutional setting. So, for example, schools, hospitals, prisons or care homes, as well as people in their own homes who maybe wish to receive meals on wheel services due to a variety of reasons. However, from all the evidence that we've been able to gather from across the UK, um, it's quite clear that our work welfare and immigration systems do not currently prevent people from experiencing food insecurity. And in fact, there are a number of different policies that we've identified as well as with uh, other colleagues. They're actually key drivers of food insecurity amongst people in the UK. And in particular, I think two of the key ones that you hear a lot about um, are the no recourse to public funds condition, which restricts certain migrants access to um, welfare and housing support as well as the two child limit on their welfare payments. That's a really key driver of food insecurity amongst households with children. Furthermore, the food that's currently being provided by the state is suffering from a magic bu massive budget cuts. Um, and for example, so this has impacted on local authorities' ability to afford to pay and provide for Meals on Wheels services for their constituents. And furthermore, there's increasing conditionality around um, support. So for example, uh, around half of the children who are, need free school meals because their families are on low incomes are not currently eligible. And this includes undocumented children who are not included in the recent extension to children with NRPF. Uh, so I'm going to draw out now some of the key points as to why we work on the right to food, as well as some of our key concerns. Um, so first of all, when people ask why we work on the right to food rather than the right to social security, for example, because a lot of what we're talking about is social security or work or whatever, um, this answer sort of has two parts. So one of which is running along a vertical axis and the other one is running along a horizontal axis. So on the vertical axis, the right to food allows us to look at food in all of its facets, and this includes a number of different issues. So the first one, for example, is food production. Um, so the environmental and social consequences of food production. And I think Sophie will be going into this a bit more in detail in her presentation later. Um, furthermore, working conditions for food workers, um, which is something that's quite often overlooked. So the Bakers Food Workers and Allied Workers Union recently found that during the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, one in five food workers actually ran out of food and had to skip food and that increased for households with children where it's around a third were eating less than they should be in order to ensure that their children had enough food and we know that food work across the uk is typified by low paid precarious work poor working conditions as well as insecure hours and contracts um, Another thing that's particularly important when you look at food in the UK is obviously trade. So a significant percentage of the food that we eat that we'll see on our plates or in our fridges will have come from other parts of the world. So that means that the UK really needs to have human rights at the core of all of its trade agreements. But obviously, this is not something that necessarily happens. Uh, so even within trade with food within Europe, there are significant human rights abuses. Um, so, for example, recently I was reading about some um, the Plastic Sea, as it's known, is the series of greenhouses in Andalusia in Spain. Um, so there are now around 92 informal worker slums um, around this, this growing area where between seven to 10,000 people live in extremely poor conditions, the majority of whom are from migrant backgrounds who have the increasing precariousness of that condition. And um, they live, you know, they're being paid well below minimum wage in extremely low um, working uh, conditions. Uh, COVID-19 has added another layer to the issues that they face, with many reports finding that inadequate PPE was provided to food growers and um, due to the lack of hand water, you know, hand washing was extremely difficult. Um, so one of them who was speaking to a journalist um, in this piece was saying, you know, we pick your food, but our health doesn't matter to anyone. They then went on to say, you know, if you complain, if you don't, they, the, the staff um, who manage the farms will just say, we'll go home. 
Um, and Hassan was saying, you know, every worker here has a family, a wife, children, but the only thing that matters to the, the food producer, you know, the people who own the farms is that they work and they get the vegetables that are then being shipped to Germany and the UK. And he very poignantly said, you know, it's like they've forgotten we're also human beings. And I think that's something that's quite often forgotten when you're just focusing on social security is you're obviously not looking at how food is produced. And finally, you know, food has a, an inherently cultural aspect. Um, so what you eat, when you eat it, how you eat it, when it's prepared, by whom, is extremely important. And I think it's really at the core of what food is for people. Moving on, so there's obviously the horizontal access, and that's focused on how all human rights are interconnected, interdependent and interrelated. So that means whilst there are important elements, like some of those I've listed above, that are, you know, at the core of the right to food, the right to food is intimately connected to all other human rights, including the right to work, the right to housing or the right to health, for example. And this is crucial that we see rights as interconnected because that's how people experience their rights and experience rights violations. So, for example, if a person is experiencing housing issues in the UK, it's been in the press quite a bit, you know, the really substandard asylum housing accommodation that's being provided um, that quite often has very poor cooking facilities, no storage, um, amongst other issues. Um, it's very clear that, you know, you might immediately be thinking, oh, this is a housing issue, but obviously, if people are not able to cook food, so they're having to rely on takeaways or having to reduce the amount of food they eat, that has an impact on their right to food. And again, that will have an impact on their right to health and so on and so forth. Um, another key issue that we're looking at at Sustain um, and that we're very concerned with is how budgets and economic decision making are forming a key part of the right to food. Because in order to achieve this right, there needs to be a sufficient allocation of financial resources. And in the international human rights standards that the UK is committed to, this means that they've you know, said that they will pledge the maximum available resources. Now, this isn't a set amount and it will vary from country to country. And it, you know, there is some allowance for governments to cut budgets if this needs to be done, but this has to be done in a way that's both rights respecting and does not disproportionately impact certain groups like we are seeing in the UK at the moment. Uh, furthermore, privatization is increasingly being used by governments who are undertaking austerity policies. And the justification for this is that it will reduce spending as well as increase choice and provide a better service. Um, however, privatisation is often resulting in substandard services being provided and spiralling costs. So rather than it being a win-win, it's very much a lose-lose. Um, I think one of the key, um, the most recent issues when people think about privatisation and food might have been the food parcels that were provided in England by private catering companies when the schools were closed. And I can again put some links in the chat if people um, didn't catch that in the press. And you could see the, the, the food that was provided by these private companies was not only really uh, substandard, it was really small amounts, but it also wasn't provided in a hygienic way. Um, one particular example, you know, there was a few slices of bread, there were a few slices of cheese, there was a third of a carrot, some baked beans in a little plastic bag. It was just not enough food for the child to live on, but also it wasn't nutritionally balanced. And just the way it was provided was completely contrary to how you should be providing food. Um, and finally, I'm just going to sort of conclude on the judiciability point. Um, so whilst legal action, of course, should really be the last resort um, that, you know, we shouldn't have to be taking the, the UK government to court over food issues, the lack of incorporation of the right to food is really impacting on people's ability to use the courts to protect their rights as that last resort. Um, so whilst there have been a number of legal cases that have challenged the UK government's decision making over food policy, um, and I think um, Christine will go into these in a bit more detail later on, they've unfortunately always been quite limited in scope and have predominantly either had to rely on the Equality Act, so you have to prove discrimination, or the Human Rights Act 1998, which um, is basically based on um, civil political rights. Um, so last summer at Sustain, working with the Good Law Project, we took the decision to undertake legal action. And essentially, this was to try and basically prevent children going hungry over the summer holidays. So what we were challenging was the UK government's decision to not extend free school meal support over the summer holidays. Um, and we chose the mechanism of judicial review. Um, and so that's a type of court proceeding in which a judge reviews the lawfulness of a decision or an action made by a public body. As above, the, the lack of the incorporation of the right to food or other socioeconomic rights meant that we had very, very limited um, legal avenues. And whilst at the end of the day, the UK government did U-turn, and this was in the face of not just our legal action, but also concerted campaigning um, action from across the sector. 
um, even if the case would have gone to court and we would have been successful, do you, the judiciary scope of action would have been severely limited. It wouldn't have been able to make any pronouncements on economic and social rights, but really at best what it would have been able to do is find that the, the government's decision-making process had been flawed. Um, and whilst the legal um, actions have under, been undertaken, such as the one I mentioned, but also around healthy start eligibility, free school meal eligibility, they've had tangible changes for millions of food insecure people across the UK. They've not been able to go far enough and resolve the root causes of hunger in the UK that, as we've mentioned before, are you know, caused by an inadequate social safety net, hostile environment measures, as well as um, insecure low paid work. And so that's one of the reasons why we're pushing for the incorporation of the right to food into domestic legislation, as well as better protections for food throughout um, all government decision making. So I think I'll end there so as to allow enough time for questions. Uh, so back to you, Catherine. Thank you very much, Imogen. Um, we'll carry on now with the next presentation. Um, and our next presentation is from Dr. Kirsten Shields, who is an expert in international human rights law um, and lectures in international law and food security at the Edinburgh University Global Academy of Agriculture and Food Security. Um, Kirsten, if you're ready, then I'll pass the microphone over to you. Thanks very much, Catherine, and thanks also Imogen. Um, yeah, thanks for this opportunity. It's really, uh, I'm going to try not to lecture anybody today. And um, it's nice to have this panel format in order to open up some of um, the work that has been done around the right to food. So it's um, important to acknowledge the amazing work that Sustain are doing to campaign for the the incorporation of the right to food into, the, um, into UK legislation. Um, my work is definitely on the research rather than campaigning side. Um, and some of that research has um, really spotlighted the fact that Though the people that are doing all the right to food work are civil society organisations and that the state, there seems to be a responsibility vacuum around who is pushing for um, improved standards and um, who is pushing for regulation of corporation, corporations within the food industry. Um, and the incorporation of the right to food is really exciting. That said, I would say that part of my research has been about um, looking at what happens after the incorporation and um, internationally looking at problems whereby the right to food may be within the constitution, but it is not um, meaningful. So the right to food exists in several constitutions, in, in the Bolivian constitution, Brazilian, Ecuadorian, um, South Africa also has in its constitution, Kenya, as Haiti, Guyana, Nepal and Nicaragua, they have it in their constitutions. There's another set of states which have um, some level of integration. But nonetheless, we can't say that because this, the right to food is, with, is within the constitution that these um, are, you know, havens for uh, food security. There's still a lot of food poverty, food insecurity and hunger that exists in these contexts. So um, well, my doctoral research was on um, the, the fair trade movement and um, what its impact was compared to non-fair trade farms. But um, since then, my research within the area of the right to food has been on looking at how to work with the law that we have, which is the law at the UN level, and how to make that meaningful. And in some contexts where the right to food has already been incorporated, um, why, why are levels of hunger or food insecurity still so high? And um, the, I'm, not, I'm not a Puritan about the right to food being the only method. I think that food sovereignty um, is, is also a very, a very um, compelling movement and 
it, it's very effective in, in different contexts. But if we are focusing purely on the right to food, we have to look at what are the problems that happen after the law is in place. And that means um, monitoring and enforcement. Um, the right to food falls within this grouping of economic, social and cultural rights, which have historically met resistance and rejection. And um, that is partly to do with the, the sense that these rights, economic, social and cultural rights, like the right to food, housing and water, um, that they necessitate resource allocation by the state and um, that, th that in fact how this, and some theories of the state would say that the state should decide how resources are allocated and that it shouldn't be for lawmakers to do that. So this has been the historical argument. Of course, it's flawed and um, very frustrating, but it has always stood in the way of economic, social and cultural rights being given equal footing to civil and political rights. And that certainly still pervades with the right to food. Um, and that then has implications for monitoring and enforcement, monitoring um, a paper in a paper. Um, I went into this in quite a lot of depth about how the UN FAO um, suggests the right to food should be monitored and the, the questions that are left out, such as who should be doing the monitoring, what should they be monitoring, um, and how should they be reporting it? And all of these questions are not answered and therefore um, monitoring does not occur and is left to organisations on an ad hoc basis to try to grab data where they can um, rather than a systematic census that to, to collate the data. So this is really significant. Um, it has potential, especially within a data context, to, to try to systemise data on food security, but how these things are defined and how the data is collected is full of hopes at present. So there's a hope perhaps that from the UN Food Summit in um, September, um, perhaps the idea of national food policy, the national food councils, which have these powers to monitor and to report, um, perhaps that will come to the forefront. Certainly that's that's the paper that I'll be um, discussing then. Um, so another dimension then, which Imogen referred to, is uh, the right to food is implemented, then it's being monitored, then what about um, enforced? How does that happen? Who's held responsible when failings are found? And um, that's where strategic litigation is so important. And we have very few cases globally on the right to food. Um, we have one from India on school meals and another um, one from South Africa on fisheries. And part of my research is also to, to look at how to um, widen, widen out that category of cases that could be relevant to the right to food to create a proper um, collection of right to food relevant cases internationally. Um, and then Imogen mentioned that Sustain had led this amazing campaign with the Good Law Project in the UK where they threatened to take the UK to court over um, uncertainties around the UK school meal programme. And although the, the, um, the problem in a way was sort of resolved before the case got too far, um, the threat of litigation was very effective in, in that context. And um, it was packaged up as being a success for social media and for the Marcus Rashford campaign. But behind the scenes, the fact that Sustain and the Good Law Project had brought this case um, with um, their fantastic lawyers, Jamie Burton um, and Dan Rosenberg, uh, was, really, was really powerful and um, obviously, obviously um, showed the, the power of just threatening this kind of litigation is very real for governments.
So um, that was a fantastic, fantastic result. It would have been even better if it had went to court and we could have the, the um, judgment to rely on in future. But as it is, it, there was a lot of very important um, precedent and work that went into that case that can be discussed and used. So, um, but these but these cases are still very much the exception, and there's still so much to do once the once the law is written to actually make that law real and to translate that into change for for food systems. So, I think. Um, partly out of frustration and um, um, feeling just helpless, um, when lockdown came, it was it was fantastic to see organisations that were not waiting for the state, that were not waiting for the government to pass a law to say that everyone has the right to food, and it was equally you know fantastic and equally kind of tragic that. Um, again, it fell to volunteers, um, some of them unemployed, some of them newly unemployed, many from the food sector, uh, who were now working to provide emergency food parcels. So um, we were involved, when I say we, I mean myself and colleagues at the Global Academy, um, in two, two of these emergency food services in particular, um, first of all, with the Fair Share dep Depot in Leith, um, I set up a volunteer service so that um, every day there would be four volunteers from the university community, staff and students, some very senior staff as well, um, who were on the rota, who went down to the Leith Depot to help with um, the processing of the food donations that the Fair Share de Depot were receiving, so the Fair Share Depot received food um, per week, for, which is surplus food from supermarkets, and they break down these pallets, the boxes of food, and put them into, um, um, they, they break them up into different packages for different community groups in the, in the region. And that depot works partly with staff and partly with volunteers, and many of them had to self-isolate during um, during the first lockdown. Many of them were retired or had health conditions that meant that they had to shield, um, and therefore the, the, the depot was receiving more donations than normal, and it had fewer um, hands on the deck than normal. So. Um, we provided the daily support, and it was also, a, you know, an act of um, solidarity to to do that. And that was a that was um, a useful experience to see um, as as an example of not waiting for the state and to see what is happening behind the scenes. And the other community organisation that um, I became more involved with and Sophie, who's also on the call, also became involved with is um, Bridgend Farmhouse, who, who ran a, a food service. So the farmhouse is on, um, uh, let's see, maybe five miles out of the centre of Edinburgh, um, fairly central. It's on the outskirts of a large housing estate and the area is historically considered to be quite deprived. And Bridge End <clears throat> was established about 10 years ago with national lottery funding to trans transform this old dilapidated farmhouse building into a community centre. And um, it is glorious, it's a beautiful place. It has a bike shed, it has an art studio, a barbecue area, um, a pizza oven, and a re more recently it started a community cafe and it ha runs food education projects. So they um, quickly realised that people were having problems accessing food, not just financially, but also physically. People who were living alone, um, who, who didn't have someone to deliver food for to them, um, especially in some of these housing estates, some elderly people who were who felt kind of trapped in their estate, 
and um, Bridge End really on a shoestring and just on their wits ran an amazing food service and um, um, they delivered over but the report the last report said 75,000 meals but and I think the updated report is a hundred over a hundred thousand meals during that period um, and maybe maybe Sophie will go into that in more detail I'm not sure um, and perhaps we can discuss that in more detail if if that's the the part that's interesting it's hard to know from the it's hard to know the crowd here um okay so so with lockdown then this participatory aspect of research really was given a chance to to um to come alive and um within the university then uh within the global academy of i'm starting this right to food uh, and nutrition research cluster and that research cluster has a grouping of projects some are more theory based and some are more action based um and we've, we've we're working on various different projects one project is um that's come out of the bridge end experience is about developing a recipe box which helps people who were receiving the food parcels to transition away from the reliance on um, pre-cooked delivered meals um, but transition away from that receiving um, a food box which they can cook themselves but also building into that elements of solidarity and community and conversation um, through the kind of network that that surrounds it and at the same time helping to underpin the food production locally by sourcing using predominantly locally sourced ingredients um, and it's as I've, I've heard about similar initiatives in other parts of the UK so um, it's really great to to see these mushrooming all over the UK um, and another part another thing that we're working on in that uh, cluster is um, which Sophie's involved in is looking at southern perspectives on school meals and how to do school meals differently um, and in line with kind of food sovereignty and um, and the right to food um, so to summarize then i would say that um, from a research perspective i am very interested in how to make the law impactful once it's on the paper how do we take it off the paper again and um from a research and and in, in my research um i found that i can no longer ignore the real world challenges and the real world activities that are happening right under our nose and that the the real challenge in research is to incorporate them um with equality and um and respect and and time and and to make to to really um understand fully the social processes and the social challenges that surround making the right to food real in practice and i should also say that i did invite eric from bridge end to join this call but he was busy today um and and he was he, yeah but but i'm sure that other bridge end volunteers um and staff will um be keen to be in touch if anyone wants to to talk with them okay i think that's all from me right now thanks a lot thank you kirstine for those insights into the social and legal challenges there around the right to food agenda um, we have one final presentation or introductory presentation um, before we get to the questions and um, so again um, for our attendees if you have any questions whatsoever to put to our fantastic panelists then please leave those in the question and answer function or in the chat function um, we have with us um, sophie quist who is coordinating um, the Glasgow Food and Climate Declaration on behalf of Nourish Scotland. Um, 
Now, Sophie's okay. been having a oh sorry, lovely. <laughs> Sophie's been having a few um, issues with internet connection. Um, so I'm going to ask really quickly. Would you like me to try sharing your slides? Would that be the best way? Uh, yeah, I th hope hopefully my connection. It is scratching right a little bit on my side. Apologies to everyone. Um, but Catherine, if you wouldn't mind sharing my slides, and we can make the presentation available to everyone if I do cut out. Um, I'm not quite cool enough to give a presentation without slides like the other speakers, so you're going to get a small slideshow from me, um, or from fine. Catherine, rather. I will do that just now. Brilliant. Um, but while you find that, um, I just want to say thanks to the other speakers for the great presentations, and hopefully this follows quite nicely from that introduction um, from Imogen into why we why we work with the right to food i think from nurse scotland's perspective we can nod a lot to the priorities that she were listing and the way that sustain works with the right to food so um, um so sophie you, has Catherine, done a, sorry, um, sophie has done a lot of work on I'm just having a, on food systems governance climate change and human rights and as we've mentioned she's currently coordinating the um, Glasgow Food Right to Food, De oh sorry, excuse me, the Glasgow Declaration on Food and Climate Change um, on behalf of Nourish Scotland. Um, so if we're good, I'll pass the microphone over to you. Thanks so much, Catherine. I am just trying to make this screen work with the unstable internet. Give me one sec, that should work. Um, one second. There we go. Okay. Um, so thanks, everyone. I think I was just cutting out before while I was trying to thank the other speakers. Um, but what I wanted to say is I hope this presentation follows quite nicely on those priorities and difficulties around the right to food. I'm going to focus um, specifically on the work that's been done in Scotland, um, not just thanks to Nourish Scotland, but to a broad coalition of people campaigning for um, the right to food here, um, to put the right to food into law and to translate it into practice, but also a parallel process in Scotland um, to incorporate human rights more widely, which also impacts our prospects for protecting the right to food. Before launching into that, um, thanks for the introduction, Catherine. As you are saying, I'm Sophie Christ, um, and I work on with Nourish Scotland, which is a food policy organization working for a fairer, healthier, and more sustainable food system in Scotland and beyond. Um, I'm also a colleague of Christine's, as she mentioned, and I'm really pleased to be in such great company today. Um, my role in Nourish Scotland especially is connected to COP26, the 26th climate conference, which will be held in Glasgow in Scotland later this year, hopefully. Um, and I work here on food systems and climate change in particular on the Glasgow Food and Climate Declaration, which I'll get to later, hopefully in the Q&A. It's a commitment by subnational governments um, from small municipalities to Scotland and regions to tackle the climate emergency through integrated food policy approaches. And that last element is really central to what I'll cover in my presentation as well. Um, could I have the next slide, Catherine? Thank you. So um, as the other speakers outlined really excellently, the right to food touches on all areas of our food system. That is to say the way we produce, process, transport and consume food and all of the people along that chain. Um, and, the food system, and a food system that realizes the right to food is one that works for everyone, not just groups of people, but from the soil where the food is grown to different groups, to future generations. Um, and food systems governance, um, which, which is really how we work with the right to food at Nourish Scotland in many ways, is based on, that is based on the right to food, would seek to address some of all these interconnected issues so that, for example, measures we take at the state level to reduce the environmental impact of food production are coupled with efforts to ensure that we rely less on emergency food aid because everyone has access geographically or financially to healthy and culturally appropriate food. And to tackle those issues in an interconnected way required an integrated and a rights-based approach. Could I have the next slide? Um, next slide, please. 
Okay, I'm ever so sorry. It seems to have paused. So if you can just bear with me, I'm going to see no what worries. you can do about that. <laughs> I may have to share the screen again. That's fine. Apologies for the, the hiccup. Um, but I can I can continue because I think it's not completely vital and then the slide can be pulled up. Um, so our core campaign on the right to food um, and getting the right to food into legislation in Scotland is led by the Scottish Food Coalition, which is um, a coalition of civil society organizations, academia, industry, that campaigns primarily for a Good Food Nation Bill. And this Good, Nation, Good Food Nation Bill would be a new law on food that takes a whole systems approach. Um, the resulting legislation would then be a coherent framework that ensures that the food system contributes to everyone's health and well-being, values the work that puts food on our tables, supports animal welfare, sustains wildlife, natural resources and the environment for generations to come. And the bill would be, in that sense, a very transformative shift. Oh, if I can stay on the other one. Um, a transformative shift for food systems governance that I outlined earlier. Can you jump? A slide back, Kate, if that works. Thanks. Um, so there are four main elements to the Good Food Nation Bill. The first and, and probably most important that underpins um, the other ones is that it should enshrine the right to food in Scots law and be based upon the right to food. Um, and this is, yeah, as I said, this is really the foundation for the other three elements because the right to food warrants accountability, a whole systems approach, but at a very fundamental level, basing a food systems food systems legislation on the right to food would shift the way that we view food in society. So moving away from looking at food as merely a commodity, so look at it as a social good or a public good, as a, as a human right. Um, it, the right to food, of course, also requires a human rights approach that's based on equality, on participation, on accountability, and on bringing people into food systems planning. The three other elements um, that we're campaigning for in a Good Food Nation bill is that the bill should include duties on public bodies, including local governments, so that there is, we're working to bridge that gap that Christine highlighted between civil society and charities picking up the right to food and the state taking that responsibility. Um, it should also set out clear ambitions, statutory targets, for example, on reducing um, food, household food insecurity and reducing greenhouse gas emissions from the food system and set out cross-cutting food plans that could be updated every five years um, that, should be, that should be monitored um, in terms of their progress. And I think this is where the Good Food Nation Bill that we're envisioning could hopefully do contribute to some of that work of translating the right to food from black letter law, from incorporation into practice into a meaningful realization. And finally, very much related to that, we're also campaigning or calling for the establishment of a statutory food commission that would oversee the implementation of the bill, ensure coherence, ensure participation of actors across the food system, um, and ensure accountability for making progress within the duties under progressive realization of the right to food. Um, next slide, please. Perfect. So we're next for the Good Food Nation Bill to just give a brief history of what's been happening politically and in Parliament. We've had a political commitment in Scotland for the Good Food Nation Bill since 2016. In 2018, public consultations began. Um, not least, um, they were championed by the Good Food Nation Ambassadors, which is a volunteer network of people promoting the right to food in Scotland, but also many people across the country. And there was an overwhelming support um, for putting the rights of food into law, for having a cross-cutting legislation, and interestingly also for um, articulating everyone's roles in making the right to food real in Scotland. Sadly, the bill was dropped in 2020 during the pandemic, as were many other things in the, in the legislative program. But at the same time, as Imogen was outlining earlier, we saw food insecurity soar in, during the COVID-19 pandemic and it really acted as a magnifier in that sense on the existing issues in our food system, not just on food insecurity, but also on the plight of migrant workers and the role that they play in our food system, on what happens along the supply chain and on just how long food supply chains are and how difficult it is to establish shorter ones. So the need to ensure the right to food um, and, and that the right to food underpins food systems governance came to the forefront of many people's minds. 
And that's reflected in how all of the major Scottish political parties, with the exception of the Conservatives, support adopting a Good Food Nation Bill and enshrining the right to food and law in recent party manifestos. Um, so what remains to be seen here is whether the two will be connected um, or whether the Scottish government will focus on incorporating the right to food in a parallel process. Could I have the next slide? Perfect. Um, so to talk a little bit about that parallel process, in 2018, work began in Scotland to adopt a comprehensive human rights legislation. This was motivated partly by Brexit, which has weakened human rights protection in the UK. Um, and in 2019, a task force for human rights leadership was set up by the First Minister. The purpose is to design and deliver a proposal for a new statutory human rights framework for Scotland. The recommendations were released earlier this year in spring. Um, they're here on the slide. So as you can see, there's a recommendation to incorporate socioeconomic and cultural rights, as well as um, protections for women, for ethnic minorities, um, for persons with disabilities, for older people and for LGBTI people. And interestingly, there is also a recommendation to incorporate the right to a healthy environment. So this is really exciting for the right to food because it's located in this framework in two places. Of course, it's located on the economic, social and cultural rights in the right to a healthy, um, to an adequate standard of living. But it's also located in the right to a healthy environment, which includes the right to sustainably produce food. So that's another avenue for securing the right to food in Scotland, and especially for understanding the more environmental um, and sustainability related size of the right to food. Um, so we're quite excited to be working with the Environmental Rights Centre for Scotland on, on understanding and exploring what those connections are. So the question, as I mentioned before, that remains here is, will we have a right to food enshrined through this process, or can we hold on to also having the right to food incorporated in a Good Food Nation Bill when hopefully that materializes? And we're hoping and campaigning for the latter, um, especially because I think Christine outlined this so well in her presentation about the, the very important need to make sure that incorporating the right to food is translated into practice is actually becomes meaningful in people's lives and the good food nation bill a framework law on food systems governance is very important for achieving that um, so it remains important to us that the good food, that a good food nation bill is grounded in the right to food it's also likely to come into law sooner than the human rights bill which would ensure that we um, so we don't halt progress and thankfully that is something that the task force itself has recognized um, I'll very, I'm conscious of time, Kate, so if I can have the next slide and I'll try and go through it relatively quickly. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about projects we do that are less focused on policy, but work more on translating the right to food into practice. Um, and also with a nod to how we work with data in this sense. Um, so one of them is a quite new project that my colleagues are working on, so I can only do a very simple introduction. It's called Our Right to Food, and it aims to make it easier for everyone in Scotland to afford food that keeps them healthy and well. And that starts by understanding what people would choose to eat in Scotland um, as a healthy and enjoyable way to eat, and then aims to generate an understanding of where more support is needed to make that, that diet affordable and make that accessible to people. So really inform at a very granular level what the right to food looks like in practice. The other area that we're exploring a lot at the moment with COP26 coming up is the connection between the right to food and climate change. This is the work that I lead on in Nourish. Um, and what we're looking on here in the first instance is putting food systems on the table in international climate negotiations because food and the right to food is often neglected, but food systems contribute to climate change and are simultaneously vulnerable to, to the climate and the nature crises. So it's really important that we look at a whole systems approach and bring that forward in climate debates. But hopefully that's something we can pick up in the Q&A as well. Um, I think I will finish there. If you can give me to the last slide, Kate. Perfect. That's all for me. For now. 
Excellent. Thank you very much, Sophie. Um, so I guess we will now move on to um, questions from our audience. So if you do have any questions at all for the panellists, please just pop those in the Q&A function or the chat function um, and we will get to those now. Um, the first I'd like to ask actually, Sophie, because the um, climate food and climate change declaration is actually looking like it's going to be reasonably important. It's getting a lot of attention. Um, go down ourselves and I know a lot of other large organisations have become partners of the declaration. Um, perhaps you could explain to us a little bit about what it is. I mean, I know it's a little off topic, but it is still quite um, important nonetheless. Sure, I'm, I'm very happy to. Um, and I'll post a link to our website for it in the chat as well. So. The Glasgow Food and Climate Declaration, um, I think it connects a lot to what we've been talking about with this whole systems approach that the right to food calls for and the element of justice in it. Um, it's a declaration that sets out the importance of taking a whole systems approach to tackling the climate emergency. It's a commitment by subnational governments. So that's everything from small municipalities to regions or to subnational governments like Scotland. Um, to, to tackle the climate emergency through integrated food policy approaches that look at health and climate and biodiversity and access to food um, in a holistic way and brings together these different sectors in food system planning. Um, it's also simultaneously a call um, on national governments to act and to, to drive up their ambitions. It's focused on subnational actors because that's where we see a lot of the food systems innovation, um, cities, local governments are doing some really innovative things when it comes to joining up different policy levels. So it's really a call to say, national governments need to be as ambitious, create enabling environments so that this local action can be, can be scaled up and it isn't blocked, it's supported, but also include food systems in nationally determined contributions to tackle climate change, for example. Um, so for anyone on the call who's interested, please do get in touch or sign up if you're representing a local government who can do so. Oops, sorry, thank you very much. Um, so yeah, if you could please put that in the chat and then that way people can access yeah. it and, and find out a little bit more about it at the leisure. Um, we have quite a lot of fantastic questions already. Um, so I will start with um, the first one from Alex. Um, would it would a right to food need to also set a food quality threshold? Um, for example, the a, a right to food of um, good quality. I don't know who would like to start us off talking about that. Imogen, perhaps. I can. I was going to say, Sophie, let you have a little bit of break from speaking. Get some water there. <laughs> um, Yes, I mean, there are already food standards in the UK um, that are relatively high, obviously can always be higher. And I think so it would it would include a part of that. I think there are actually a number of measures that could be understood as part of the right to food, but that the government doesn't, the UK government doesn't portray as being part of the right to food. So one of them is our current existing food standards, but also, you know, household food insecurity measurement, free school meals. These are all policies that, you know, are part of a right to food, just aren't portrayed as such. Um, so I'm not entirely sure if you mean food standards within food that's provided or food standards overall or environmental standards. Um, but I think, yeah, there, there is a lot of work around uh, the food standards within institutions obviously can be improved. But I think that would also have to go hand in hand with budgets, like I said, because obviously the food that's provided can only be as, as good as the budget that's provided. Um, and I think there's, like I was mentioning in my presentation, there's a growing concern around privatization and how that's sucking resources out of budgets whilst providing uh, subpar services. Um, I don't know, Sophie, does anything you want to add on that? Um, I think, no, I think that's a good reply. I guess the only thing is, is maybe just going back to basics around the right to food, that's certainly in the in the way we understand the right to food. I think you outlined actually this really well in your presentation, Imogen, that it's not just about, um, you know, not being hungry, but the right to food has this adequacy element that requires food to be safe and to be nutritious, but also to be culturally appropriate. And I think that's really important to, to think about as well when we talk about food quality and this idea of understanding, well, what what does good food mean? What does good quality food mean? It's about safety and about nutrition, but it's also about culturally appropriateness. Thank 
thank you very much. And um, when we're kind of on the subject of um, food that's provided as well, um, in the UK, it's kind of on, on an international scale. Um, the UK is widely considered to have quite an established sort of welfare system. Um, yet at the same time, we're seeing increasing issues with food security um, going on within the UK. Um, what is the scale or um, role of charitable provision in the UK at the moment? And what do you think is going wrong? I can kick off if, if no one else wants to. Um, I mean, that, that's quite that's such a broad question. I mean, all these questions are so broad because it touches on so many different issues. But I mean, I think the scale of food aid use in the UK is ever growing. You know, we're seeing year on year increases that are just the, the number of food parcels that are being delivered are going exponentially up. Um, every year in particular, this has been um, further increased by the COVID-19 pandemic, as I'm sure many people can understand. But I think it's also crucial to know that most people who are food insecure don't access food aid. So actually just solely relying on um, food aid figures um, is not really good enough um, to understanding the full scale of food insecurity. And I think in particular, so this came up in a panel discussion I was, I was on yesterday. And one of the things we were talking about is how quite often food waste and food poverty, you know, one is seen as the solution to the other, but they're, they're completely distinct issues. Food waste is an environmental issue. We need to reduce food waste. Food waste should be eliminated from, you know, the food system that we live in. And that, that needs to happen urgently. But the solution to that is not by moving the food waste to people who are food insecure, because then you're sort of creating a two tier system and you're also denying people choice, denying people availability, you know, access to the food that they want um, to eat. And, you know, food insecurity, like you're saying, you know, we do have a welfare state, we do have um, a work system that should have workers rights protections but they're just not going far enough and I think what we've also seen over the past decade is not just that the you know there have been limitations on the amount of money that you can claim through social security but also more and more people are being pushed out so you've got the NRPF restriction that completely limits people accessing um, welfare support and then you've got the two child limit which pushes out certain children which further increases food insecurity you've got um, growing number of sanctions growing you know the benefit cap there are a number of different policies that are just excluding people from accessing um, these support measures and I think that's that's a growing concern that slowly this this net that's meant to be there is more and more eroded and I think in particular you know the, the amounts just simply aren't enough if you look at um, you know the amount of money that you get on universal credit or asylum support for example it just doesn't meet living costs in any which way asylum seekers currently have to live on less than 40 pounds a week and there's no way that you can live in the UK on that amount of money whilst also having to meet, you know, your travel needs, your food needs, your uh, clothing, toiletries, all the other issues. Um, so, yes, I think there are many, many issues. I don't know if anyone else wants to jump in on that. Yeah, um, sorry if I lost connection a while ago. I'm not sure if the whole thing crashed or if it was just me. But anyway, um, yeah. Brilliantly answered, Imogen. Um, I would say as well that what's really scary is that um, we have a whole generation or, you know, series of generations who don't realise how poor their nutrition is um, and how, how and what a poverty of a food system they are experiencing. So some of my research has been in South America and um, street, street, uh, street dwellers in Bogota have more access to fruit and vegetables than people living a mile away from me in Edinburgh. So it's really hard to see um, what is the level of, um, of food insecurity because most people will not report food insecurity. They may not, they may have concern for someone else, but they may not recognize um, their own, they may, they may consider their own difficulties in in reaching or accessing fresh food as being very normal and also then you know your diet and your um, appetite adapts to want that, that salty um, sweet snack and um, 
so there's this manufacturing of appetites as well, which then also masks the problem underneath. So that's a slightly different answer probably than what the question was about how, how much food aid in the UK at present. And I'm not sure. And I, I've, I found that during lockdown, the, the boasting about the amount of donations that was going on was really tragic from supermarkets saying, you know, we've just donated um, it was often in terms of meals. We've just donated a million meals, um, say from Iceland or Sainsbury's or one of these, one, a supermarket. And um, actually they weren't donating meals. They were donating, you know, packs of sausages, maybe apples, other tin, you know, tin goods. They were donating food, but meals is something else. And there's so much, as everyone knows, you know, so much cost in labor and energy um, and fuel as well that goes into preparing taking that raw food and making a meal. Um, so it's a really, it's a really deep problem. Um, also the cost of owning a kitchen, I think in lockdown, someone did that to, you know, they said, yes, I can survive on three pounds a week, but I'm living in my parents' house and their, their kitchen costs approximately this, or I'm renting this house and, you know, the kitchen is like half the flat and that costs, you know, 500 pounds a month. So yeah, I can eat cheaply, but you have to have this whole infrastructure to eat to to eat well. Um, so I, I'm not a fan of the putting a number on the problem issue because, um, as I go into in that paper about monitoring, it does um, uh, it it can it can mobilise as soon as you have a number, it can mobilise, but it can also mean that if it doesn't have a number, the problem doesn't exist, and that's a you know. That's a quantitative versus qualitative conflict within research. Thank you. Um, a question here from Mags. Um, just a bit of background for those not from the UK, but due to recent socio-political changes, um, the UK is having to negotiate new trade deals across the world. Um, Mags is asking what needs to be done to ensure new trade agreements that include or relate to food are built in line with the right to food, especially for producers. For example, the current um, Australian deal that's being negotiated at the moment um, and the Northern Ireland protocol arrangements. Well, I, I would say that um, the concept of comparative advantage, which the food system was built on, whereby um, we trade, we, con we concentrate on um, intensive agriculture, inten intensifying production, producing the maximum of what you, of what can be produced in the shortest amount of time. Um, that is built into the trade system. And the trade system has to to let to kind of loosen off of that, definitely has to let that system go in order to for um, diversi diversification of agricultural produce. And with that diversification, um, there may be a, a slower harvest, um, but we may also be able to um, waste less as well. So there has to be um, perhaps more protectionism built into trade agreements to respect other states, traditionally producer nations um, who are producing the majority of the world's food to allow them to produce food for self-sufficiency and um, self-sufficiency shouldn't be viewed as such a bad thing. I would also just, just add on that. I put the, the link in the chat. Um, Sustain is doing quite a bit of work around uh, trade and food standards within trade. But I think to, to sort of summarize and bring it to the core, I think there's an issue when food is solely seen as a commodity that can be traded and it's just connected to the how much it's worth on the stock market. I think that's, that's a significant issue. Um, and food needs to be brought back to the right and to be understood as outside of um, just simply being a, a commodity like any other. Um, so. I would say as well, just sorry, I'm, I'm still here. I just took my video off because the connection is a bit unstable, but hopefully my voice is coming through okay. Um, I think that exactly gets to part of the core of it, Imogen, about it's how food is valued within the trade system. And the it's not the most recent anymore, but the report that came from the current special rapporteur on the right to food, he released the report on trade last autumn or summer 
um, that had a really good framing of how the right to, if you look at trade from a right to food lens, you can look at trade systems trying to protect um, or working to working with and to protect existing food ecologies and that being the starting point rather than the international trade system and that would protect food not as a commodity but as a right and looking at self-sufficiency like Christine outlined and I think it's that kind of framing of the trade system that will be really helpful to protect the right to food. Just to say that I think are we running over time? Um, no, not necessarily. We can continue for a little bit longer, um, okay. say another 10 minutes and then we'll wrap up. Um, just to say that the questions are brilliant and if we don't manage to get through them all, um, we'd be happy to, to answer them on email, but um, I'm trying to type some answers. If that helps, because I thought we were finishing at one. Thank you, that's fantastic. Um, if you put them, Kirstine, in the chat rather than the Q&A, because unfortunately the Q&A, I believe it's only the participants that have written the questions that can see the answers to them. So oh. it would be useful perhaps for others okay. to see them as okay. well. Um, okay, so this is a particularly interesting one um, and I guess it sort of depends on you having a good overview of um, policy in other countries, um, but we'll we'll have a go. I'll put it to the panel anyway. And um, this is from Tanya, who is asking, are there any cases where the right to food has had a significant impact when included in a country's constitution? OK, so um, I, I'll, I'll start if, if others are happy with that. Um, that's a big. That's a good question. And the India Indian case of the school meal legislation um, is is always given as an example. And also, um, South Africa has had some good legislation with on the right to food and more broadly on economic, social, and cultural rights, um, and that has resulted in litigation. So, but. But to answer just by giving those examples is to suggest that impact is just case outcomes. And that definitely does create, um, it can it can mobilize a lot of state resource and, um, and um, state actors and state agencies can change their mandate as a result of a, of a case. Um, and in India, it did do that. But I also think that having the right to food in the constitution in Bolivia and in um, and in, in other in Nicaragua and Nepal and other places, um, it does have an impact, even though it hasn't resulted in court cases. And it's very hard to measure the impact. Um, uh, and and it's very hard to measure the impact if you consider it as a standalone provision. But in those countries, actually, the constitution is much more orientated towards collectivist rights. So um, it won't just be um, the right to food. There's also the right to, to shelter, the right to water, um, the right to education. They're all in the constitution as well. So it's about making more space and, and, um, and making more state resource available for collective um, rights. So the impact um, can be about a culture of um, collective goods, a cu culture of sharing resource, um, a culture of conserving natural resources. Um, and you know that doesn't always translate to every aspect within within those societies, but it can be the ethos within the legislators, within within the executive, and within the courts. And so it's really hard to measure the impact. But wow, that would be a wonderful project. I would love to do that one day. Or I'm sure others others will beat me to it though. I suppose just to build on on your answer there, Christine. I think 
there are a number of cases <clears throat> within Europe where there are protections, constitutional <clears throat> protections or legislative protections for minimum standards, so minimum living standards. So there's quite a famous case that it's nearly a decade old now in Germany where asylum support rates were changed by a decision from the constitutional court because the rates weren't enough so as to ensure that people were able to access not just food but also housing and other issues but food was explicitly mentioned so i think it's again the thing of maybe it's not necessarily just on the right to food but it's as part of a broader understanding of socioeconomic rights um that would allow for that um change i don't know sophie if you wanted to add on that no i i think that was quite comprehensive um you've covered the best examples that i know of as well Fantastic, thank you all. Um, Loper from Coventry University is asking where we, where does the panel stand on, um, well, from a right to food perspective, on the government effectively discharging their responsibilities onto the charitable third sector? Um, I'm happy to, I think that's a really good question. Um, and I, it's, it's, slight, it's a slightly tricky one because there is, there is a balance there that to be found in between when are you laying off or not taking responsibility for delivering the right to food, but at the same time, community groups um, and, and volunteering groups and networks are, can be absolutely critical partners in terms of actually re reaching people. And I think that is something we saw in the pandemic a lot in terms of actually reaching communities and making sure that no one's falling through through the gaps. I think I recently came across what I thought was a great example of where I'd say this kind of partnership is um, in line with the right to food. I was, I was speaking to someone from the government of Sao Paulo in Brazil who had a quite impressive food response to the food insecurity in the pandemic where the local government provided um, they provided cards for people to go and buy food for people for whom that didn't work. They provided fresh produce boxes and then they provided meals for people for whom the boxes didn't work. And that was funded, funded and coordinated centrally in the local government, but they were relying on partnerships with the Solidarity, Solidarity City Initiative, um, where community groups were able to actually reach people and build that bridge between the local government who was funding this support and providing the food but to reach people and make sure that nobody was falling through the cracks, that there weren't people they couldn't reach and that the whole thing was delivered effectively. Um, so I think, that, yeah, there are many nuances to that answer. So I'd be interested to, to hear from the other panelists as well. I can mm -hmm. see Christina's typing. Oh. <laughs> um. I think for, for me, just on that question, at the end of the day, the state is ultimately responsible. So the state needs to be providing the conditions whereby everyone can afford food. Um, that is, you know, they should be having the legislation that's underpinning that. So either it's welfare, immigration, work, whatever the policies might be that need to change to ensure that they need to do that. And of course, you know, community initiatives can add, you know, the social aspect, the other things that the state just cannot provide. And I think they, they perform such a core role in providing that support. But at the end of the day, that you know, it, it's a very problematic space if the government's relying, the UK government's relying on food aid to ensure that people get fed. I think that that's when it gets very, very problematic, um, and I think that's a real dereliction of responsibility there. Um, but yeah, like to say, you know, but then again, community initiatives, and I've been involved in many over the years, can help provide other things. But it shouldn't be, it should be a choice to go there, not an obligation. Thank you very much. Um, we have a question here from Idrisu Bakari um, from Ghana. Um, Idrisu, I'm kind of assuming that you may be a, um, a representative of the Minist Ministry of Health um, from your um, from your comment or question. Um, so apparently the Ministry of Health in Ghana is launching a nutrition policy document um, for consideration and they'd like some assistance to incorporate the right to food into policy. I don't know if everybody would be interested in me putting them in touch with Idrisu in that case. Okay, fantastic. So yes. Very exciting. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, um, just to say with the last question as well, um, absolutely, it's, it's, it's so unfair that it's left to volunteers um, to respond. Uh, yeah, I think that's I think that's been absolutely outrageous. That there was just this expectation that um, 
people will survive. Yeah, and I think, I mean, that's, that's partially why I work on the right to food is because I spent nearly a year working in refugee camps in Greece, providing up to, you know, 10,000 meals a day for people. And it's like, this is, a, you know, the state is responsible for ensuring that people have a house and people have food and people, you know, the reason that people were in these camps was not because of any fault of their own. It was because the state was derelicting on their obligations vis-a-vis uh, -vis refugees and migrants, but also just their basic socioeconomic rights of people. Um, so I think, yeah. I would just come in and, and, and agree with those two points about the state responsibility, because I don't think I quite captured that in my reply before, which was very much about, you know, when you have the response and how do you have these partnerships. But I think what's really important to hold on to there is also that there is an underlying issue here that needs to be dealt with is why do you have these this, this in food insecurity in the first place? And that needs to be part of the response of looking at the state responsibility from the right to food lens and say, why do we have that situation in the first place? And how can we tackle that? Um, which is a much more root cause way of looking at things. Okay, thank you all. Um, I think we'll wind up there because I am now conscious of the time um, and it is moving on. Um, so I'd like to thank our panelists very much for coming to talk to us um, and to give us more of an insight into what the right to food means. Um, and Thank you as well to our um, audience for coming and joining us and for all the fantastic questions. Um, we will follow up on this. So I will send some um, follow-up emails um, about the working group, Godan's working group on food poverty, and of course about the work that our panelists are doing um, and links to um, the initiatives and the information that they referenced in their presentations. Um, so thank you everybody for joining us um, and we hope to be in touch with everybody soon.